Apple just blew everybody's minds with their new Mac Studio and their Mac Studio display featuring the brand new M1 Ultra chip that takes two M1 Mac chips and puts them together for an absolutely insane amount of performance. And in this video, I'm going to help you decide exactly which configuration is going to best meet your needs and save you up to $1,800 by not getting upgrades that won't actually help you. We have done an insane amount of tests and comparisons over the last year and a half since Apple launched their own chips, looking at binned and unbinned models, the different amounts of graphics cores, CPUs, RAM and how that affects real world productivity and all of that applies to this new Mac. And with that, we actually bought three Mac studios ranging from the base model all the way to a fully specced out one. So we're gonna have real world comparisons showing you the data soon. So if you guys wanna see that, make sure you guys click subscribe down below and help us reach our goal of 1 million subscribers. With all that said, let's jump in and I'm gonna start out with the new Apple Studio display. People have been waiting for this display for eight years now and I'm so happy that Apple priced it at $1,600 hundred bucks instead of something more expensive. Now that is still very pricey, but compared to LG's Ultrafine 5K that came out six years ago and that still sells for 1300, this is a much better display. Now when we go into it, there are not that many options. The first one is choosing between standard glass or the nano texture glass. Now this upgrade is only $300 where it used to be a $500 upgrade on the iMac or a thousand on the Pro Display XDR. But with that said, I still would not buy it unless you know that you have a ton of reflections in the room that you're working in because even though this is way better than a matte film over your display, it does still limit the sharpness and detail of this display compared to the standard glass. Now, along with that, this is Apple's first desktop display or display in a MacBook that actually runs at 600 nits. The Pro Display XDR for standard non-HDR content runs at 500, as does this new 16-inch MacBook Pro, the 14-inch MacBook Pros, the iMacs, all of those. So that extra uh, 100 nits is also going to combat any reflectivity. Now, the next choice that you get is the stand. For an extra $400, you can upgrade to a hinge display that allows for adjustment in height. Now that stand that is similar looking to this with the Pro Display XDR that I have is a thousand bucks. But what you have to make sure that you don't miss is that this does not allow for rotation or removal or anything like that. So that price is just for height adjustment. And if you look at this image, the display is much closer to you if you have it kind of in that normal range compared to being tucked further back. And that is something that can be a pain with a lot of desks. So for 400 bucks, I don't think it's worth it. You can always get one of those little stands to lift it up or maybe even put it on your Mac Studio if it fits on there. Moving on to the Mac Studio, we are greeted with a couple options right out of the gate. And one thing that you guys have to know is that it doesn't matter which one you choose other than the base storage. So this $4,000 option, literally twice as expensive, we've never seen such a big jump, it right away doubles your RAM and your SSD. So if you're somebody that doesn't need a terabyte of SSD, let's say you use a server, then you can go with the base model and then upgrade the components that you need. Now with that said, with this Mac, this is one of the few times where I would suggest for people to spend more money on storage. In the past, I always said, hey, buy an external SSD or a hard drive, don't waste too much money on storage here. But this time, because Apple is using the fastest SSDs on the market and their prices are the same, you are actually getting a killer deal spending a little bit more money and going up to say a one terabyte SSD or a two terabyte, even the four terabyte isn't that bad. Because if you look at external SSDs to buy something with that capacity, they're not cheap at all. And the speeds are gonna be much, much slower, sometimes even up to seven times slower than getting 
getting it internally. So if you're somebody that works off of your system without a server, I would definitely look at getting at least a two terabyte, maybe even a four terabyte if you're going for the higher end configuration with the M1 Ultra, because you're paying $1,000 more for this insane performance. Now, with that said, another thing that you guys have to keep in mind is that if you're trying to get your Mac Studio as quick as possible, sometimes just switching your storage configuration can get you your Mac one or two weeks faster. So make sure and go through the different options. Now, opening up this configuration page, the first thing we see is which chips that you want and how many graphics cores. One thing you guys have to remember, don't make this mistake, is that when you upgrade to more graphics cores, you are not getting anything else. For with the base M1 Max, you are not getting extra Thunderbolt ports by going to the 32 core graphics. You're not getting more encoders, you're not getting any extra bandwidth, none of that. It's simply a little bit more graphics performance. And a lot of times when we're doing real world tests, especially with these high-end M1 on Mac ships, we are not that limited by the graphics performance. It's only a little bit of people actually that are out there by getting limited by that. Apple has so much dedicated hardware that speeds up specific things that a lot of times it's other things like the encoders or decoders. So if you spend the $200, it's not uh, that you know bad of a deal, but you might not see any differences, especially if you're somebody that does things that are more CPU limited. For example, if you're doing Xcode, if you're running photo editing, you, are, you will not see any difference whatsoever. But with that said, jumping up to the M1 Ultra, which has twice as many CPU cores and twice the amount of graphics cores from the base models, that will make a massive difference, especially for things like photo editing, where the extra memory bandwidth is also going to help. And if you're somebody that does 3D rendering, gaming, or video editing, that extra graphics performance is going to be massive. And if you're somebody that works with video like we do, where we're exporting a video a day, having double the decoders and encoders is really gonna speed things up. For example, a six minute video should export in under a minute if you go with the M1 Ultra. Now here's another huge mistake that I want a lot of you guys to pay attention to. This M1 Ultra with 64 graphics cores instead of 48 is a thousand dollars more. Once again, you don't get anything else other than more graphics cores. You don't get any more decoders, any extra ports, any extra bandwidth, none of that. And the graphics performance that, that's gonna come with the 48 core already is at such insane levels that are, that are pretty much meeting RTX 3080 desktop 3090 performance. So unless you're gonna utilize all of that and be limited, spending the extra thousand dollars isn't gonna do much. Now, another thing we noticed with these chips in the lab laptops and also the charts that Apple provided is that we don't see complete perfect scaling. So for example, with the 32 core M1 Max in this laptop, it did not give you proper scaling compared to the 24 core. It was a little bit limited. And the same thing could potentially happen here. If the M1 Max model, it runs at 60 watts, you double the GPU cores. If you're going to the 64 core model, you were not seeing doubling as far as wattage in their charts, meaning that we could have a little bit of a limitations in terms of power usage and performance. So I would really question if you need the extra graphics cores. I think most people do not. And the M1 Ultra with 48 core is going to be the sweet spot, both in terms of performance and cooling in that pretty small chassis. Now let's go ahead and talk about memory. So you have the option of 32 or 64 with M1 Max or 64 and 128 with the M1 Pro. Now with our laptop videos, we compared 32 to 64 and I threw everything at it. Windows virtual machines, video editing, photo editing at the same time. And we saw pretty much no difference between 32 and 64 using it in scenarios that nobody would ever use them. And here, going up to 128 is just insane. 
If you don't believe me, go watch that video. See how well this Apple Silicon with the unified memory works in macOS and think for yourself, do you need 128? It's an $800 upgrade if you already are getting the 64. A huge price increase. I think nobody really needs that. So there you guys go. I think the sweet spot is either that base model for two grand, maybe upgrade the storage, or the $4,000 M1 Ultra, leave it as is with the 64 gigs of memory, and then maybe upgrade your storage if you want a little bit more, if you're working off the internal storage, it's actually not a bad deal. Like I said, we have three of these coming in. We will be doing some detailed real world comparison videos showing you guys the wattage, the frequency, if there's any slowdowns, fan noise, performance, all of that. So make sure you guys click that circle above to subscribe. Check out one of those great videos over there, including the deep dive into the M1 Ultra chip. This has been Max, and I'll see you in the next video.